Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at 6 starts now. Exact track 40 radar showing rain is on its way to southeast Michigan, but it's what comes after that that's likely to make a bigger impact. Forewarned weather tops our news here at 6 o'clock. That's because of a wind advisory set to go into effect while most of us are sleeping. Kim Adams here with a look at a rather consequential weather we're expecting here, Kim. Absolutely. We have this wind advisory that will go into effect at 4 a.m. and continue through 10 o'clock tomorrow night. We do expect wind gusts 40 to 45 miles per hour out of the west. And right now we are also tracking just mainly some light rain. But the big story over the next 24 to 48 hours will be the wind. Starting here at 5 o'clock, we've already seen some gusts up to about 27 to 29 miles per hour. But as we advance through time tomorrow morning at 4 a.m., we'll continue to see those winds pick up. They'll have gusts at about 30 to 35. And then tomorrow afternoon and tomorrow evening is when we start to get those 40 to 45 mile per hour wind gusts. Enough to where if you have Christmas decorations outside, maybe those big inflatables, I would deflate those tonight and probably just go ahead and bring them on into the garage if you can. Exact track 4D radar. We are watching a few showers out to our west. I'll do some street level mapping for you right now. Dry in West Bloomfield, but White Lake just had a few sprinkles also in Wixom, but there's a line of a little bit heavier rain. It's not severe or anything like that, but just some garden variety showers. And we do need the rain here in Metro Detroit. I'll have more on the wind tomorrow and our temperatures will be falling quickly throughout the day. Wind chills tomorrow could even get down into the teens. If you want to keep track of all the weather, the best way to do it in between newscasts is by downloading the Forewarn Weather app. It's free. Just go to your favorite app store. You type in your city and you can See the radar, the wind, all the latest information. Go to the App Store and type in WDIV and download the 41 Weather app today. All right, Kim. What should be the cost of a quarter century of lost time? Two brothers from Pontiac who spent 25 years behind bars for a murder they didn't commit want somebody to pay. George and Melvin DeJesus, who were released from prison this past March, are asking the court for more than $125 million. Rod Maloney, live tonight with the story. And Rod, they say they were set up. Oh, absolutely. It's a 24-page complaint, and it makes some rather remarkable claims, stating that a sheriff's deputy and a polygraph examiner teamed up to frame them for murdering a woman who lived next door to them back in 1995. An emotional Lansing reunion happened last March. George and Melvin DeJesus kept apart by the Michigan Department of Corrections for 25 years. Today, they came together looking for answers. One of the strongest reasons of filing this lawsuit is we want to know why. And in getting that answer, maybe this won't happen to somebody else. Their suit is against former Oakland County Sheriff's Detective Lieutenant William Harvey, Chester Romantowski, his now closed polygraph business, and Oakland County. The brothers claim those people and entity worked together to put this man, Brandon Gohagen, on the stand to testify the brothers forced him to rape and kill Margaret Midkiff of Pontiac, claiming that he passed a polygraph test. Attorney Wolfgang Mueller claims that he can prove Gohagen lied in that pretrial polygraph. It had to be from Harvey convincing Romatowski to fabricate a report because Romatowski was too good to get this that wrong. This isn't even a close call. The money ain't even nothing compared to what we lost uh, those 25 years, especially for myself. Uh, I was at the hospital getting ready to have my daughter born. The Oakland County Sheriff's Office out with this statement this afternoon, quote, obviously this case goes back more than 25 years preceding Sheriff Bouchard's tenure. More facts will need to be gathered because none of the people involved in this still work here, end quote. Now, Melvin was arrested while he was waiting for his daughter to be born. He never saw her in person or even touched her until they got out of prison. Also, Chester Romatowski, we did reach out to him. Turns out he's 87 years old, lives in Florida, doesn't seem to have a working phone number. We reached out to him. We emailed him to try and get a response, did not hear back from him. We also reached out to William Harvey. We did not hear back from him. The DeJesus brothers say that they think that Oakland County ultimately will bear much of the financial responsibility for this case. Back to you. And like he said, the money doesn't even compare to the time lost. Um, right in the piece, you mentioned Brandon Gohagen. What, what more do we know about him at this point? 
Well, he, he is 50 years old. He is in prison in Ionia, the Bellamy Creek Correctional Facility, serving life in prison for another murder that had exactly the same M.O. as the first. Now, he had pled guilty to second-degree murder in that case, and uh, part of his trial back in 2017 is what led the Attorney General's office to get involved in this first ca in the first place mm -hmm. in order to exonerate the DeJesus brothers. We'll see how it all plays out, Rod. We appreciate it. Devin. We now move to a lawsuit that doesn't seek any money, but instead wants a court order requiring certain safety procedures within Oxford schools. Change for Oxford is expanding their lawsuit just ahead of the one-year anniversary of the shooting that, of course, killed four Oxford students. Sean Lay, live with the reason the group is pushing for class action status and what that would mean in this case. Sean. So speaking to attorneys involved in the case and families involved in the case here in Oxford, Devon, it's worth repeating. Both say it has nothing to do with the suit with money. It has everything to do with safety here in all Oxford schools. My motivation was my children's motivation. This was his decision. It was the kid's decision. They, they didn't feel safe at school. Um, we weren't getting answers as parents by attending board meetings, sending emails and whatnot. Um, and so the kids, you know, wanted to have the policies and procedures looked at and know that they could feel safe at school. Oxford parent Andrea Jones is one of the parents involved with the Change for Oxford lawsuit, a lawsuit that began with 19 Oxford students against Oxford schools, not seeking money, but seeking safety in schools, a lawsuit that could now turn into a class action suit and would include every student in the district. Scott Weidenfeller is the attorney representing the students and parents and explains why they are asking for this to be certified as a class action lawsuit. We're not asking for money for any of the class members. And um, so because there's no monetary component to it, we're just asking the court to come in and, and to enforce safety procedures to force the school district to adopt them and to implement them. All right, back here live in Oxford. So bottom line here, attorneys are saying that Attorneys are saying uh, that if the judge does certify this as a class action and if families do not want to take part, they can easily opt out. We're live in Oxford tonight. Sean Lee, Local 4, back to you. On. The trial for the parents, meanwhile, of the gunman in the Oxford High School shooting being postponed. The Michigan Supreme Court ordered the state appeals court to hear an appeal from James and Jennifer Crumbly. The appeal will deal with whether there is enough evidence to send the Crumblies to trial. It is a victory for defense attorneys who argue involuntary manslaughter charges don't fit. The trial was supposed to start in January, so the order comes one day, of course, before the one-year anniversary of the shooting. Ethan Crumbly also went before a judge today for a hearing because he's 16 every month. A judge has to decide whether he'll stay in the Oakland County Jail or be moved to a juvenile facility. The judge ruled today Crumbly will stay where he is in the adult jail. He pleaded guilty to all of the charges in the shooting. The formal sentencing expected next year. President Biden is heading back to Washington after pushing his economic agenda in Michigan. The president toured the semiconductor manufacturing site SK Siltron today near Bay City. He highlighted the plant's recent $300 million expansion. The president praised union workers at the plant, saying they are the key to solving recent supply chain issues. We're going to be the supply chain. The difference is going to be we're going to make that supply chain available to the rest of the world, but we're not going to be held hostage anymore. And Michigan will once again become the manufacturing hub of the nation, and that's not a joke. Because when I got to the United States Senate as a 29-year-old kid, I had to wait a couple days to be sworn in. But when I got there, this was the, uh, one of the epicenters of manufacturing. This summer, President Biden signed the CHIPS Act, giving tax credits to companies that make semiconductor chips in the United States. Our phone lines have been open since 5 a.m. Giving Tuesday today, taking donations for Thaw. That's the heat and warmth fund, helping people struggling to pay their utility bills. Our Pam Osborne now live in the phone bank. Let's see how close we are to reaching our goal. Pam. $95,000. That's where we're at right now. But the goal is $150,000. You can help us meet that goal by calling the number on your screen there. That number 888-579-4950. Now, 
DTE Energy is going to be matching donations up to $50,000 today. And if you're wondering if you have to have thousands of dollars to make a difference, the answer is no. $350 or $3.50 rather provides a full day of electricity for one family. This is for our neighbors. 70% of households helped by Thaw have a child or a senior or a veteran living there. So let's help keep them warm this winter season. And I should mention, you said the phone lines have been open for most of the day. A lot of the calls coming in, in addition to the people that are donating, are people who are looking for this help. So there is a great need out there today. You can donate by calling the number on your screen or by visiting us on clickondetroit.com. Thank you to all who have contributed so far, but we have until 7 o'clock to get that remaining $55,000 in. So let's see if we can get it done. Devin, back to you. We certainly invite you to help us. So many others have today. All right, Pam.